Well, this week saw commemoration ceremonies in Turkey for the participants of the Freedom Flotilla killed last year by Israeli forces. A year on, and what is the legal position of those whose relatives died on the Mavi Marmara? And what of the missing belongings of all the passengers? Joining me now in the studio to discuss these issues is the co-founder of the Palestine Legal Aid Fund, Rashad Yakub. Rashad, welcome back to Remember Palestine. Thank you, Lauren. So a year on, we've still got nine dead Turkish civilians, a lot going on at the high political level um, between Turkey and Israel. But what on the human level, what on the, uh, on the, on the rights level and the legal level, what actions have been taken to, uh, on behalf of the flotilla participants? Well, I mean, the, the efforts in terms of the legal uh, response to the attack on the flotilla um, climaxed in a conference uh, of lawyers, of about 110 lawyers, which I attended from all around the world, who were representing individual passengers who had been on the various different boats. So does that mean there's 110 individual cases being considered? Well, probably more, probably mm. more. Um, and these were individual lawyers who'd been sent to attend, mm. uh, including ourselves. And the resolution of that Doha conference, which was sponsored by Fukura, um, was basically let's develop a coordinated strategy um, and basically take on the task of identifying essentially the soft spots. Where, where in terms of the international legal mechanism, mechanisms, mm. where can we devote the most resources, uh, and how can we share intelligence and evidence to make sure the Israelis don't, don't basically divide and rule the evidence. Mm. Um, yes. Because, so, I, sorry, I would have thought, so, so there's the Turkish case, they're, 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 they'll be managed, because that, that's, that's, that's about deaths. But, but are there then cases, for example, for, um, for trauma? Sure. Uh, well, uh, one good example would be, for example, the case of Esan, who's a British and Israeli dual citizen. Yeah. Um, he was shot in the back of the head. Um, the bullet ricocheted and actually left through his mouth, and he survived, you know, amazingly. Uh, he was also shot in the stomach. Um, now, to date, despite uh, representation by, by his British lawyers, uh, despite a clear-cut case in terms of um, uh, illegitimate uh, loss of life yeah. as a result of Israeli action, to date the Israelis have not conceded a single inch uh, in terms of culpability, liability or responsibility. What they have done as part of the drama of the UN fact-finding uh, mission uh, and the consequences of that is make some poultry offers to return um, some goods which again have been unspecified uh, to individuals through some sort of third party uh, fret agency and that that is about as far as and even that hasn't actually resulted Incredible. in any any return so from a legal point of view the way we've been working um, the the key opportunity is universal jurisdiction mm. uh, the only mechanism that basically allows uh, people to be tried outside Israel uh, is UJ and you know so, so so let's just get, make this clear for, for viewers. Universal jurisdiction means you'd have to wait for one of the commanders or soldiers to leave Israel, who's named in a case, who would then be taken by a member of the public, potentially, in, sign, in signatory countries. Well, not necessarily. I mean, that's basically in order to effect an arrest right. warrant. So that's to do with, actually, um, custody. Okay. In terms of, actually, the legal case... Uh, Spanish courts, Dutch courts, British courts, South African courts, yeah. a number of universal jurisdiction uh, organizations, which are basically signatories to the Treaty of Rome, have the ability to basically try people in absentia. Mm, um, okay. So that's the mechanism that effectively we are using. You probably have witnessed the changes or the attempts in change in law in Britain, which have uh, resulted from the uh, Lib Libyzivni um, arrest warrant attempt um, last year. Mm. Um, so despite uh, attempts to roll back the law on that, there's sufficient mechanisms in place to start off UJ actions. Uh, and that's certainly something which has started. The second level, which, which is quite interesting um, from a fl flotilla perspective, is, is for not, not to miss the bigger picture. I mean, the whole point of the flotilla mm. was to protest in terms of the legal mm. siege. Mm. And you know, we're sure that the Israelis' argument will be, this is a natural defense mm. of our shores, and therefore we've, we've done a, a response which is proportionate in terms of defending our shoreline. Mm. Uh, the heart it's not of our shoreline. Well, exactly. The heart of our legal case opens up not just the individuals who suffered, but actually the central premise to this, which is the fact that is Israel has basically, in international waters, sought to defend something which it doesn't own. Brilliant. Um, and and that, that really then opens up wow. in, a, in a natural court of law. My head is spinning. These are such high 
points to fight on, it, it's it, you've got have you got the best lawyers? Well, it's actually it's actually quite straightforward. It's, 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 if somebody says well, we were defending our home um, from all these assailants, and, mm. and it turns out in law that, that it's not their home, yeah. um, and they were the illegal trespassers, that's a that's a massive mm. victory for anybody who's actually prosecuting. So it's actually allowed the debate, the legal debate on the status of Palestine, and especially the siege on Gaza, to actually enter international courts mm -hmm. as a result of the bravery and the sacrifice of these individuals who boarded those flotillas. So we hope, um, inshallah, you know, in subsequent years, more, more, pe more, more people continue that pressure because it, it, it results in more legal opportunities to hold Israel accountable. Thanks very much for that excellent summary. Now, in London, survivors of the Marvi Marmara joined with supporters to remember those who lost their lives. More in this report. Nine humanitarian aid workers died and dozens were injured during the attack by Israeli commando forces on civilian passengers on the Mavi Marmara. This was the largest ship of six which was part of the Freedom Flotilla, organized by a humanitarian coalition to take aid to Gaza in May 2010. At an event in London to commemorate the first anniversary of this attack, there is a lot of sadness. But, as Lindsay German from Stop the War Coalition says, there is also a sense of hope that their deaths were not in vain, as they have already inspired others to embark on similar missions. But the other reason that we should look with some hope to the future is not just the struggle of the Palestinians, but also what has happened this year that is what an uprising and a revolution can do. With the same sense of optimism, Ben White, author of the book Apartheid, A Beginner's Guide, highlights that there is also a special connection between the Flotilla Initiative and the uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa. If you place the Flotilla in the context of the changes that have been taking place in the Middle East, you can probably make an interesting point that that first flotilla, or indeed the whole initiative of the Freedom Flotillas, uh, was almost a precursor of the kind of uprisings that have taken place in different countries in the Middle East, in the sense that it's based on people power. What is certain for Ben White is that the flotillas are both a humanitarian and a political endeavour. During the event, the author did not hesitate to make that clear to any critics of the international coalition. It's obvious that the flotilla is more than just about simply delivering supplies to Gaza. It's actually about saying, it's about resisting uh, Israel's politics of blockade and siege. Um, it's about resisting uh, an Israeli policy of collective punishment. It's not just simply a protest against what's going on in Gaza. It's a protest against Israel's policies towards the Palestinians as a whole. As part of the fight to support the Palestinians, the commemoration event in London also served as the best stage to launch One World's new single, Freedom for Palestine, which aims to get into the UK music charts. So the single you heard about there is set to be released in July, but it's already causing a huge stir on the internet. Joining me now is one of the driving forces behind that new track, the guitarist and composer Dave Randall. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Now, I have been following with interest the last 48 hours to do with the single. Uh, on Facebook, there's, uh, you know, I must, my Facebook page is almost flooded with, with connections to the single. Who's in it? And why do you think it's causing a stir? Well, we're very pleased about the stir. You're right. In the first three days, we've had well over 120,000 plays on YouTube. It's a fantastic response. Some of my uh, bandmates from Faithless are in the song, uh, Jamie Catto from One Giant Leap, members of the London Community Gospel Choir, and a gospel choir from South Africa. Mm -hmm. That was a very interesting session. Mm. I mean, I think people in South Africa get the apartheid analogy mm -hmm. between the bad old days of South Africa and Israel now, mm -hmm. Palestine now. They get that immediately. So massive support in South Africa. We've got the gospel choir there. And then in the video, we've got some notables. We've got Michael Rose and the, 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 mm. the, the poet. We've got Mark Thomas, the comedian, who's mm -hmm. been a big supporter of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And Loki, the rapper, and yeah. Jodie McIntyre. Yeah. There's a real sense of momentum. It's been fantastically exciting. So I think what's, what, what, what seems to be happening here is you've wanted to create a pop song, first and foremost, that has the words freedom for Palestine in it, and really move it from a fringe argument to mainstream. Is that happening? 
I think it is happening. We've had some huge endorsements. I think the, the song... if. What we would like to try to do is get the song into the chart here in the UK and actually I hope that your viewers will help us to do that by pre-ordering the song in this pre-release period. They can do that from iTunes or HMV Digital. If we get enough pre-orders in and enough sales during the week of release, we can get it into the chart. Mm. And I think if we get it into the chart, it will be difficult for the BBC not to play the song mm. on the radio. And com- <laughs> they com- can't. You can't put the word free, words Free Palestine together, as we know on the It's going to be very hard. If we, get a, if we get the song into the charts, it's going to make it much harder for them to censor it or to ignore it. And I think hearing that song, or, or at least seeing it on, on the internet, will give confidence to people to stand up and say, actually... It's true, what's going on in Palestine is absolutely outrageous. The way that the uh, Israelis are occupying the Mm. West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem is unacceptable and so on. Mm. It will give confidence to people to have the debate, I hope. Now, I saw something amazing on Facebook that I could hardly believe. You appear to have been endorsed by Coldplay. Is that true? We've had, yeah, they put a very uh, lovely message on their Facebook page saying that their friends were involved in, in the single which, was, of course, is absolutely fantastic. And I think Coldplay has about 12 million friends on Facebook. Yeah, they're I pretty mean, popular. that's huge, isn't it? And there have been other endorsements from quite unexpected places. The legendary American writer Alice Walker sent the most amazing quote. I don't think we've put it up on Facebook yet, but I'm sure we will next week. Um, all sorts of messages of support mm. coming through. So it's been fantastic. OK, well, let's see if we can now go to a clip and give the viewers a taste of Freedom for Palestine released in July. Enough illegal occupation, violence and racial segregation. All religious communities unite. Freedom is a human right. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out. Well, I'm sorry that was such a short clip, but we've got you here, so we will uh, go on, go online and listen to the rest of it. It's my recommendation. Hard, well, how hard has it been for you um, personally to get this made and to get people interested in the question of Palestine? You've been, you know the situation there in the West Bank, mm. um, what the wall is doing uh, mm. to, to the land of Palestine. But when you have conversations with other people in the music industry, is it difficult to bring the point across? I think that people are often confused uh, when it comes to Israel-Palestine. People often think it's two equals a dispute over land between two equals and so Mm. on. But of course, as we know, the truth couldn't be further from that. In actual fact, it's one Western-backed, well-armed and well-funded state illegally occupying a displaced and impoverished and stateless people. That's Mm. the Palestinians. And um, I think when you start to explain this and when you start to talk about what you yourself have seen, I mean, I was there... Uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the West Bank. And and as you know, it's absolutely uh, horrifying. You see Palestinians being treated by the Israeli state, by the army, as if they were animals. Mm. You see Palestinians being humiliated on a daily basis. Mm. You see Palestinians being collectively punished just because they exist. And when you see that, you have to do whatever you can. So the song for me was... I'm not sure that labour of love is is the right expression, but it it, it was something I felt I had to write. I had to do something, however small, to send a a message of solidarity to the Palestinians. Well, congratulations, Dave. It's not a small thing. It's looking like a very very big um, uh, addition to to support for Palestine. Um, What about, you know, at some point having a festival for Palestine? Have you thought along those lines of people making those requests? And also, support in America. It's fine to get it in the charts in Britain. That's Mm -hmm. a battle. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. What about wider context? Well, I suppose we start from, from wherever we can, and, uh, and the song has been my starting point. I would certainly be keen to um, get involved with a festival. I'm not sure whether the festival would be here or perhaps in, in the West Bank. I mean, I, I don't know. I'd, be, I'd certainly be interested in supporting that sort of initiative. You know, we're talking about a live aid for Palestine. That can't be yeah. far off, I wouldn't think. I've no idea. I mean, I would mm. certainly like to be involved if, um, if that is something that people want to to make happen i'd be willing to to get involved with and that. just finally an extraordinary outburst from a presenter on fox news a u.s channel calling this single evil what do you say to that oh well it's it's com- i mean it's a completely um mad suggestion obviously 
but it relates to your question about America. According to this individual, there's quite a lot of support in America for what we're saying, and so that's, mm. that's, that gives me a great reason to feel hopeful. Dave Randall, thanks very much for joining us again, and best of luck.